we will get started here. Um, I'm Jim Hunsinger of Lean Frontiers. Welcome to uh, this webinar with um, Joachim um, Bristam, who's actually coming to us from Sweden. And um, uh, what we're, Joachim and I have been having a conversation, oh gosh, I think it's been about a year or so, we've been kind of talking about this, him and I talking about this, around uh, standard work. And um, through the course of our discussion, we've kind of developed a variety of, um, I guess it's a pretty big topic. And uh, Joachim's gonna share uh, at least part one with you, what we're calling the inside out perspective. And, um, and we're gonna carry this through through a series of probably three webinars as we get rolling here in the next few weeks. I think the next one will be in January and you'll get some information on that. Um, so uh, Joachim's with uh, Lean Ability. And uh, with that, I'll kind of let him kind of uh, um, start and he'll do most of the, the discussion, kind of kind of reflecting on a lot of the conversation him and I have had over the last year. So Joachim, I'll let you take it, take it away. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and thanks for all the good conversations we've had over the past year on this very interesting subject. Uh, so um, my name is Joachim. Uh, I would say this is a joint venture between the Frontiers, uh, business through people in Denmark and uh, my company, Leanability. Um, and uh, thank you for the opp opportunity, Jim. So um, talking about standardized work is always like, uh, it's like you say, Jim, it's a, it's a big topic. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to uh, get down to a level where we, we can actually see what it is. Um, and a lot of these are like reflections from uh, when I joined the um, standardized work uh, training in Japan back in 2018. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and it took me a good while to sort of absorb and understand what we had actually learned there and uh, discussing with a lot of good, good colleagues uh, to get to some kind of uh, route. Uh, and one of the things that really caught me in Japan was uh, it went from being a, a tool or method orientation to all about people and, and how big of an impact that has when you, when you look at standardized work. Uh, so, there's quite a lot of brain, but there's also uh, a very much heart and soul into standardized work. Uh, and one of the statements that I got with me is that, first of all, it's standardized work is, is all about enabling people. Uh, of course, we want things to flow, things need to flow, uh, but it's all about enabling people to make, to make that happen. Um, so, looking at what, what actually happens when we need to make a commitment. We need to make a commitment that uh, the value we create needs to flow and create a competitive uh, advantage over our, uh, our, to our customers. Um, and as an operator who is actually the closest person to the, to the customer, uh, the operators, uh, especially on this side of the Atlantic. And we often talk about standards or standardized work as being the operator uh, solely making up, uh, coming up with improvements, making their own standards. Uh, but their, um, their reach is kind of limited. Uh, so for me, the, uh, the operator needs to promise, this is my promise as an operator, to contribute to and work according to standardized work. Uh, and I can do small improvements around me to make that happen. But ultimately, it's, it's my promise to the company uh, that I will I sort of pledge to work uh, and contribute to the, uh, the work standards. Uh, does that make some sense so far, Jim? Yeah, yeah. And I know one thing we, we spent a lot of time talking about is, uh, you know, and this has been around for a number of years, I guess, in the lean community is um, it's it's not about the tools. And one thing we had a lot of discussion on is, well, it is and it didn't. It is and since you need good tools in order to make change, make improvements, 
do different things, but ultimately it's, you know, how do you do that? So it's kind of like going from the tools to the people, which you're kind of starting to touch on. So what does that mean on the tools are important, but, but it's really the people that underpin that. So just kind of uh, maybe explain some of that going from the tools to the people and in a way back to the tools. Yeah, exactly. So uh, of course we, we can't make things flow if we don't understand the tools, if we don't understand the methods. Uh, the question is who sits on what information or who sits on what, uh, what decisions. And for me, the, uh, if the operator promises to contribute to and work according to standardized work, uh, the supervisor needs to promise something uh, as well to the organization. And that is to provide the best method, machines, and to develop skills, which would be my pledge as a supervisor. Uh, and that's about where, where my reach is. Uh, and when we jump it up to management, uh, they need to make a promise. Uh, and I think that what we've seen over the years is uh, if we push standardized work too far out, uh, then management sort of loses that perspective, their pledge to the organization, because they need to provide the conditions uh, resources and whatever it takes to make the value flow. Uh, and if we miss that component, then things get jammed up in organizations and we get these sudden shifts back and forth. We do good stuff on the shop floor, but then all of a sudden there's a new machine that turns up that is not sort of made for flow. Uh, and then the organization struggles. So for me, there's that sort of brain and pledge, heart and soul, on each level in the in the organization. Yeah, one one thing is as we talked, and actually you you were the one that said this, Joachim, and you were kind of going through that is uh, kind of like a series of promises, like you're talking about, like the management uh, promises to provide the conditions um, and uh, you know resources and whatever thing might be needed the to the supervisor and the supervisor promises to provide the best method um which is you know a lot of skills based that uh, uh methods um and then the operator promises to contribute and work according to the standard so it kind of transcends down and ultimately the uh, we promise kind of all of the above management super supervised supervision and the operator um to promise to provide a process that will flow as effectively and competitively to our customers. So ultimately kind of this transcending promises, um, it's part of the people aspect of it um, to the customer, which ultimately kind of what we're there for in an organization to provide the customer with whatever product or service or combination thereof as well. So this, that's what you talked about a lot when we talk this transcension of, of these promises. Yeah. Um... And for me, that that was super, super strong. Where once I sort of, I, I not only saw it, but I also felt it. Uh, that uh, it goes way beyond just that normal work relation, or uh, it, it's actually, and that's that's why I go to work. That's that's why I have my position is because I've done that. I've made that pledge, uh, and, and the higher we go, of course, the bigger that pledge becomes, because it it involves so many people. Yep. Another thing that also is sort of um, struck me, and, I, and I've had some uh, good conversations with a couple of Japanese senseis on the way, uh, is, um, and he, he just said it so and so well, one of them, uh, that uh, ultimately all we do is just to make sure that things are in control and we need to see if it's out of control. Um, and his, uh, so his um, um, definition of Yudoka was as simple as that. It's just, are we in or out of control? Uh, and when we can see that in real time, uh, then it's just natural to act. Uh, and I love the, the simplicity of that. Um, it's almost like, uh, and I think it's our friend uh, Dennis Becker who said, uh, it's like binary thinking. Uh, it's in or out, one or zero. <laughs> That's all it is. 
Uh, and if you have that in mind when you when you apply your tools and your methods, that binary thinking of in or out, uh, it drives simplicity. It makes it really, really simple. Uh, so instead of having all these complicated things going on, uh, just go back to that simple routine of can we see if things are in or out of control? Uh, yeah, that actually uh, reminded me. The, the binary point is uh, if, if for those of you out there that are familiar with uh, Stephen Spears' article he did oh, quite a few years ago now in the Harvard Business Review, decoding the DNA of Toyota, and uh, and, and another, I can't remember the name of the other article he did for that, but he talks about that. that things They designed the system to be very binary, just like Joachim's describe, describing a one or zero. You know, yes or no, are we meeting the standard? Just simply yes or no. And that really becomes this guidance um, for the people, for the system, but really for the people in the system to know if they're complying with the standard or not. Yeah. And, and, and when you drive that simplicity uh, as far as you possibly can and, and make sure that on all of us, we, we can see what I need to see. Uh, it sort of ties the whole, all the principles back together. Um, I was at a... Uh, at a shop for not, not too long ago, and they have these big, uh, like obeyer rooms, um, and there's many screens, and there's like million data points you can look at. Uh, and I see this supervisor coming in through the door, and she she just goes like, checks like three things. Oh, I have to know what are you looking for, uh, and she was just dead clear. She could drown in all that data. Uh, but she just came back and said, well, uh, I look for uh, basically two things. Uh, are the machines moving? And what's the status on my buffers? Because if machines are moving, my buffers are full, I don't have a problem. Uh, machines are moving, but buffers are uh, drying up. I will have a problem, but I can still do something with it. And if machines have stopped, well, I need to act like now, uh, and and that sort of that kind of simplicity that that's what we want to build and um, and foster as a culture, I would say. Yeah, that's I think that's that's a lot of we talked about that binary that real time those just simple simple cues or visuals that they can do to know if their their system is functioning or not. And if you look back at a lot of the Andon systems are uh, very much like that. It's just quick, you know, are things okay or are they not? And if they're not, then yeah. you may not tell them detail what it is, but at least tell them where to go to, to observe, to see what, you know, issue or talk to a particular operator, what the issue is. We try to make it very simple and straightforward. And, and if you drive it long, far enough, that, that is like all the decision making tools that, that you need. Nah, or should I? Um, so if we, we call this webinar the inside out perspective. And uh, one thing that I've seen is uh, that, again, we, we sort of, we put a lot of um, mandate on the, on the operators the value adding person uh, to come up with standards, come up with improvements. Uh, but if you think about it, is that really fair? Yeah. And for me, yeah, it doesn't really make sense unless we have the bigger picture with us. Uh, because uh, if you think about it as an operator, first of all, I have my job to do. Uh, and ultimately I have attack time to reach uh, there shouldn't be too much waste in that. So when do I actually do that? When uh, when should I improve all these things? Um, and there are so many things that actually influence me on a day-to-day -day basis that I have no control of. Um, so the machines, as an operator, I don't buy the machines. I get whatever I have. Uh, maintenance. Partly, I can I can contribute to it, but ultimately, maintenance is not my thing. Uh, planning, 
how does the product look like? Uh, have we actually questioned all the details in the product to make it easy to assemble uh, or deliver? Um, all the logistics around me, uh, that's out of my reach. Uh, so if, if the rest of the organization hasn't made the same pledge, which is ultimately looking at me saying, what do I need uh, to deliver ultimate value to our customers? Uh, I'm going to struggle. Um, so I would, I would stretch it a bit and say that they, that um, hypothesis, that standardized work, uh, belongs to the uh, the operators and frontline. It's actually a bit flawed, um, and I I know that's kind of sticking it out there, but there are so many things, and I've seen it over and over in my years as a as a coach and trainer. Uh, that we put people in a bad position. And we also give uh, management and leadership a chance to back off and say, well, that's your scouts. Uh, I heard someone say that standardized work is for you. And it's actually the opposite. We all need to contribute on all levels uh, to make that flow, uh, the value flow uh, for the sake of our, uh, for our customers. Yeah. Yeah, really, from that standpoint, is you're, that's a great point because really, ultimately, the operators get stuck with the system machines, overall system support that get get handed off to them by you know management, engineers, supervision. So you're right; it's they're only get, they can only a system is going to do as well as it's designed to do, and most systems aren't designed very well for flow and for standard work. So the operators are going to struggle to be successful because they've been handed a less than adequate system. Exactly. So, yeah, that's, that's so key to success of the organization and success of the operators. So that there's a big difference on uh, on standard work or, or work standards uh, and standardized work. Uh, that was another thing that we picked up in Japan. Uh, standardized work is when all these things, all these uh, things in an organization are all pointing at the same same point uh, and making full full use of that person down there. Uh, that's when you have standardized work. Um, and the cool thing is when when you when you get to a workplace where that actually exists, you can actually see it, you can feel it. Uh, but you can also see the the opposite when it doesn't work. You can also feel that sort of frustration of we're having so many demands on on ourselves or our people, uh, but they're they're not given that chance. They don't really have that that possibility because you know, we're not planning right. We're not quality of uh, information or materials coming in is too poor, whatever it is. Uh, so that's that's really where standardized work is when everything contributes to one thing. Um. Yeah, and it's uh, and some of this I think we'll, we'll talk about more probably in a more granular level in the next next webinar. Um, but yeah, so if you um, if you hand off a less than adequate system, which is what we do, everybody does. You know, everybody does. Nobody's really immune yeah. to this. Then we try to come back and and we'll say you know kaizen it to create this. But since it's a compromised system from the get go. There's a limited amount of really, you can make some positive changes, of course, but there's really a, simply a limited amount of positive change you can make in order to get it to a really functional system for the operators to utilize well and for it to have the constant high quality, constant output per tack time we want to deliver to our customer, which is back to what you're saying is it's really all this stuff prior to, that's kind of inside out, that leads up to giving the operators a system that's well-designed and functional for those purposes so they can function in their, you know, domain that they have. Exactly. Uh, that's exactly the point. Uh, so I think that that is, uh, it, it's been in our face for a long time, but I, I mean, at the same time, I haven't seen many companies that actually do this thing. Uh, that actually gets to uh, 
Uh, there's a couple, uh, but they're not many enough. Uh, so I want to emphasize that point again and say, well, uh, take a real deep look at your at your system. I, I like that sort of getting back to the system thing and thinking idea and design your system around that value adding person. Um, and then the next, next thing is, well, uh, we design a system, uh, we get all the arrows to point at the, the value adding person, uh, but then uh, we need to build foundational skills. And, and then we're back to uh, TWI, uh, all the four J's. Uh, I'll never forget uh, Mr. Kado in Japan. And I think it was day two. Uh, all of a sudden, he just stopped his teaching and looked at us and he said, by the way, you have all the four J's, do you? Don't you? Uh, and he just stopped and stared at us. Like, do you have all the four J's? Because you can't do this. You can't do standardized work if you don't have the foundational skills. Uh, and that was also very powerful to me that we, in the Western world for a long time, we've tr tried to shortcut things. We we try to overcome, but we haven't given ourselves the, the opportunity because we're missing uh, critical skills that, that are just needed to make this thing happen. Uh, uh, and just looking at... Uh, Simple questions, uh, back to Yudoka, if we're out of control, why are we out of control? Well, it could be because it's not safe enough uh, or people can't do the work. It's difficult and complex or people actually don't want to follow standard. And those are just foundational skills that the TWI programs were just designed. They had the same problems back in the 40s. <laughs> uh, but they also came up with extremely good solutions to those questions uh, or good answers to those questions. Um, so um, getting to a point where we can actually utilize uh, standardized work uh, requires a lot of skill building to get there. Uh, again, keep it simple, but we, we, need to, uh, we need to look back and say, well, what are the conditions? What are the actual... Um, what have we given our people and are we giving them a fair chance to to make it right yeah it's really kind of the what, what you talk what you talked about up front at the beginning are we designing the system you know which is not the operators but all the people leading up to deliver something to the operators they can they can use it's designed well for that purpose and for them to come in with the skills the skills are there to one to countermeasure things problems come up even with a well-designed system problems still come up to countermeasure those effectively and also that's one part of it the other part of it is the continuous improvement part one part is countermeasuring the other part is continuous improvement same thing with the skills to uh, make improvements on it which would also and this is where again Toyota did this through the iterative process over decades to make improvements on the system so the next time they they design a system or machine or whatever it is, they're designing it with all these improvements that the operators came up with in place. So they're constantly going through that iterative process. So the, the system gets better, the people are trained in the skills who countermeasure it well, they get learning from it, they make improvements. So anytime the next generation or even a sub-generation um, you know, comes through, that they're delivering back a better system each and every time to the operators who continue through the cycles of um, um, countermeasuring issues that come up and making improvements to make it better. Exactly. Uh, and that brings us back to tools uh, tools and methods uh, like we, we started this with. Uh, but it doesn't matter what tool you give people. Uh, it's never going to be better than the person who's actually using it. Uh, it can be the most powerful thing ever, um, but uh, applied uh, wrong, wrongly or uh, using the wrong tool for the problem you have, uh, then you're not getting anywhere. So knowing what tool to use when is the critical ability. And that was actually one of the, the key things that uh, 
Mr. Kato in Japan taught us. Uh, and the way he did it was kind of subtle uh, because he brought us uh, paper stacked this thick uh, with templates from, from Toyota. And as Western as we are, so we go home in the evening in the hotel and we look at all these templates and say, okay, yeah, we need to learn how to do this. And next day, he brought another 25. And next day, 25. It's like, you have to be kidding me. Uh, but what, what he was actually teaching is uh, there's an infinite amount of, of tools, especially when you have, <laughs> if your drawing board is like, an A3, uh, empty A3 paper and a pencil. Uh, so there's an infinite amount of tools. Uh, so building that sort of library of things, um, having seen things and you can start to apply and you can, and so when you do that and why it's so important to use pen and paper or you know, simple tools is for my leader to see how, do, how are you actually thinking? Because it, when it comes down on paper, I can see how you think. And now I can actually coach you uh, to see how you can get better at developing your skills. And now I can coach and develop people in a way different manner. So, uh, we don't want to get stuck in templates. We don't want to get stuck in um, a limited amount of tools. Uh, on the contrary, we need to just develop things that can solve the problem we have. Um, Which is why the skills are so important. Exactly. Uh, those are the foundational stuff. And then you sort of build on that um, and you start to apply and you start to play around with it. Uh, and now I can actually help you to become even better. Um, yeah, I, feel, I remember one thing you mentioned what Mr. Cotto said to you, you guys remember there that he said, you know, he gave you some of that stuff and some things obviously that we use that, you know, came from Toyota, but he said, there's all kinds of other things that you guys are using that are good things and useful. Use them, apply them as you need for your particular circumstance and countermeasures. There's nothing wrong Thank with you. them. If they're useful and they help you resolve, you do it. You do it. Yeah, exactly. And um, really, the tools are really really a result of iterative processes of, back to the same thing, iterative processes of countermeasures for problems and making improvements. The tools evolved, in a sense, out of that. So you don't do the tool for the tool's sake. You do it because oh. it's helping you resolve particular, um, you know, in Nakata language, challenges you may have. Yeah. And I think uh, what we've seen over the years is uh, things coming out of Toyota that probably were never meant to be shared. Uh, I was just an idea from someone. He uh, he or she came up with a drawing or something, and all of a sudden it turns into ah, oh, that's a tool that Toyota is using. No, that's just my notes for myself to sort of make sense of the problem I'm standing for. Uh, so I think that's the uh, uh, the the kind of thinking that we need to get back to in in the rest of the world. Yeah, one thing that they made me think of. This is actually from the skills lab we did in October, a discussion came up, which I think it parallels with this, is you got a discussion about waste, eliminating the waste, and, this, and the discussion was, actually, we don't eliminate waste. Um, what we focus on is what our objectives are. What are we trying to accomplish? And you got to come up with countermeasures and, you know, problems, which the skills help you with, the J, the J skills, even the, the Kata skills help you do that. Um, and as a result, you eliminate waste, eliminating waste in the purpose, the, the objective of whatever product you're trying to make for the customer is the objective, but through the process of utilizing these skills to countermeasure things or to make improvements, you'll eliminate waste. Waste is a byproduct. Eliminating waste yeah. is a byproduct of that. Exactly. I think that's important. Um, yeah, that's one of my brother's uh, strongest uh... Uh, shows when he when he does that and like Toyota they they strive for a condition and then they turn back and say whoa what amount of waste that we actually eliminated yeah. by taking that step instead of the opposite because then then you're going to be busy for the rest of your life <laughs> uh, if you want to sort of 
uh, eliminate random waste. So that was about as much as we we had time for this uh, this time. There was there was a question that came in. So let me. Okay. Uh, how should we approach standard work in the framework of a lean process improvement work or project? Do's and don'ts, and what's important. I think we may have touched on some of that, but if you can elaborate a little bit more. Um, read that question again. No, sorry. Yeah. How, how should we approach standard work in the framework of a lean process improvement uh, work or project? What are the do's and don'ts? Um, so what you don't want to do is, is start applying tools and methods. Uh, what you should do is always uh, find your bearing first, understand what problem are you actually solving. Um, and when you, in that process when you when you define your problem uh my my tip of the day is always to sort of split those into three categories so uh, you want to move your process uh but that automatically means you need to move your people and you need to have assisting uh, systems uh that runs with it and they always run in parallel so if you if you split those into three categories, uh, it makes it easier for you to see what what the process needs to do, be doing, but also what uh, what your people need, uh, so they can actually operate that thing uh, over here. Uh, but um, uh, focus on the focus on the people. Uh, yeah. An old truth. Uh, yeah. When you say that, made me think of uh, just. For example, like an A3, A3 is a tool, but what's the, it's not the, it's not a tool for the sake of itself. It's for what you just said. You need to make sure you define what your actual problem is. So the A3 is just one, there's other tools that helps yeah. you, helps you define, think through analytically, uh, ask questions, define what that problem is. So only then can you, okay, what are particular countermeasures or you could say experiments you want to run in order to resolve that. So it's just a tool to help you do what you're really doing is defining what the problem is. Once you feel you're confident, you've defined it well, then you could think through some potential countermeasures to meet whatever your objective is. Yeah. And I, and I think it already starts with when we, when we're not on a problem solving quest, but we're on a, uh, fulfilling some kind of lean thinking. Uh, and I think that's where, where it sort of twists our mind a little bit. Uh, we need to get back to, we're just solving problems and we're going to do whatever it takes to make that value flow. Uh, full stop. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Joachim. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, that makes, makes sense to the person who asked that, that question. Thank, thank you for asking questions. Yeah. Uh, um, so we'll go with that, and, and, and we'll get it out here pretty soon on day, probably said sometime in January for part two. We'll get in some more granular things. Really, this was we just really wanted to cut with the, um, the kind of the, um, well, I don't say inside out or outside in. So it is at the, the inside out perspective. We just wanted to set up this perspective. So as we go into the next webinars, we'll talk about things that somewhat maybe a little more tangible in some ways, a little more granular level. So thank you again. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you for everybody uh, joining us. And uh, we will, um, we'll, this is being recorded. So we will get this out to you. I think what Skylar usually says, I think 24, 48 hours, we'll get the, the link out, out to you, everybody. And also too, we'll send you, um, Joachim put together some uh, PowerPoint slides that kind of summarize some of what he went through. And we'll send that out for folks to look at as well in reference. Awesome. Uh, I hope this brought value to you guys, uh, and I hope I will uh, we'll see you again next time in January. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. See ya.